Hello, good evening and welcome. Um, I'm Tracy Hamston from Moore Meadows and welcome to the fourth in our series of online talks. Um, a few words about Moore Meadows for those of you that aren't familiar with us. Um, it's a Dartmoor based community group of about 800 landowners, farmers and gardeners who are restoring and creating flower, flower rich grasslands on every scale from meadows on garden roofs, shed roofs and to acres of hay meadows. So a real kind of range of uh, landowners. Um, as anyone who has a meadow knows, they bring in, bring in wildlife and the well-established ones contain such an abundance and diversity of life that they really are some of our best habitats. Um, to support the formation of more groups um, like this across Devon, we've created an online meadow makers forum and I'll put a link to that up at the end of the, the um, evening so you can have a look. Um, and that's for people to be able to communicate with each other, share information and hopefully um, create new groups all around Devon. And in fact, since we launched in the new year, we've already got some new groups in West Devon, South Devon and Blackdown Hills springing up. So do check it out. Um, as I say, I'll put a link um, in the chat bar. So roadside verges, why verges? Why are we so interested in them? Um, well, we've put together some great talks that hopefully answer those questions and really raise awareness of the importance of them for wildlife and showcase some um, really great examples of some verges and explain how you can get involved to save wildflowers and create valuable wildlife habitat. We've got some national specialists on road verge management and also a discussion on how to get involved plus some time for questions at the end. So can I ask you to post your questions in the chat window on YouTube and we'll get through as many as we can um, at the end of the talks. So with the backdrop of the loss of 98% of our species rich grassland across the UK over the last 100 years, roadside verges can really be refuges to species that have largely disappeared from our countryside. And the fact that there are these linear corridors that run through our landscape can connect, um, connect habitat for wildlife. Um, so we'll be hearing from our speakers about the detail and the sort of nuance of management of verges in different situations. And we'll also be joined by Devon County Council um, ecologist Sarah Jennings, who will explain about the life, Devon Life on the Verge scheme. Um, we encourage you to get involved. So our first speaker tonight is uh, Leah Goubert, who's the senior ecologist for the Highways Agency in the Southwest. Um, he's an ecologist with over 20 years experience in research, ecological surveys, habitat management and conservation in the UK and abroad. He's been working with Highways England since 2003 and has a wealth of experience in road ecology, roadside verge maintenance, mitigation for protected species, um, delivering biodiversity gain and targets within that road context. He's worked on a number of conservation projects aimed at promoting species and habitats along transport corridors and beyond. So um, welcome, Leo. Hi, thank you very much, Tracy. Uh, very kind of you. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, as Tracy said, I'm the senior ecologist for Highways England in the Southwest. And one of my jobs is to manage the road verges as sympathetically as possible. Um, with nature in mind and the biodiversity net gain whenever we can. So, um, what I would like to do, I'm going to start just. Um, talking about the importance of, uh, well, before I get there, I have to go through some bad news, I'm afraid, because roads and natural environment, they don't quite mix. Uh, one of the problems is that they cut through virtually every single uh, terrestrial ecosystem in the world, but they have become a, part, a permanent part of the landscape. So roads have a great ecological impact on the environment, and, and many of these impacts we have only just started to understand. It becoming uh, uh, it's it's part of a, a aquatic pollution through um, sediments and all. If you imagine all the grit that we use in the roads to keep the traffic going in the winter, they all end up in the water. Um, things like tire dust and um, they carry so much heavy metals that we only just started to understand the impact 
it has on surrounding habitats. Uh, noise, vibration, light, uh, direct mortality of animals, and so on. But now we come to a point that um, our, our nature around us is just is so in such a precarious state that the world, the road verges actually become such important sanctuaries for many species. And in the recent years, it's, uh, it has attracted much attention. Uh, it has become important areas of conservation in uh, in many parts of the uh, of the um, of the world. If you take for uh, Holland, for instance, I mean, nearly half of the road bridge is actually protected because of the um, uh, important uh, habitats for uh, plants and animals. So if you look at the road bridges from above, you can actually see what that means. I mean, the, uh, we're pretty much surrounded um, by agricultural landscape. So um, if you can see here pastures and um, um, areas where they, they grow crops and food, they pretty much kind of dominate the landscape. In road verges, they offer that linear um, habitat running all the way along connecting all these kind of tiny hedges. So they do uh, offer a fantastic opportunity for, uh, for wildlife. And it's often one of the best uh, um, habitat qualities um, and the only link to past landscapes. Because if you think of the landscape as a, as a whole, a lot of it has been modified because of our needs, um, uh, like land use and agricultural use. So some of the road bridges, they can be extremely valuable, especially when they're adjacent to triple size and other designated areas. Um, they provide this fantastic uh, connectivity throughout the landscape. And they're relatively undisturbed. Um, okay, you do get the traffic going past, but there is uh, no dog walkers and there are no people cycling or motorbiking or um, on, on, on the habitat. So it's quite, quite good in that respect. And it has this um, highly aesthetic um, value for us. And a lot of, most of us don't really realize it, but for people that live in urban, in urban areas, this type of um, uh, connect, connection with the um, natural world actually is only achieved by when you, you look out the window of your car or you, know, you look out the window of the bus or train, and then you see the greenery along these uh, transport corridors. So one of the things we're going to talk about is, uh, is what we called um, the soft state, which is um, in how is England terms is uh, we refer to um, any area that within the, uh, the transport, the highway corridor that is not tarmac or concrete. So we call that the soft state. And the area when you, you think um, about the size of it in, in England and Wales is considerable. So we nearly 180,000 hectares. That includes all the big roads um, and the small county lanes as well. So how is England? The um, habit um, network covers about 30,000 hectares of um, soft state of verges. So that covers a, a, a range of different habitats, including grassland, woodland, heathland, uh, marshes, um, ponds, etc. So there is a map here of the strategic road network and uh, it covers all the A roads, uh, the trunk roads and the motorways in blue. And to highlight the importance of these road verges, um, I can talk about a, a personal experience I had which took me on a walk uh, on, to, to the west of Exeter all the way to Penzance. So I pretty much walked the, the, the whole route doing botanical surveys. So we covered as myself and a, a colleague, another uh, botanist. So we walked 284 kilometers, well, about most of it, but uh, we surveyed 450 hectares of grassland and heathland along this route. So we covered Dartmoor here, uh, uh, Bodmi Moor, uh, Gorsmoor area, and um, all this area down here on the A38 as well, which is quite, quite interesting. So this area is quite tiny. It represents not, not 2% of Great Britain. So it's just really, really tiny. But what we found was quite incredible because we found over 330 different species of uh, grassland and heathland plants. 
So that's nearly a quarter of the native species uh, described in the uh, atlas of British and Irish flora. So this is another simple study carried out by Plymouth University, which is kind of highlights the importance of uh, the, the roadside voyages when you compare to adjacent um, agricultural land. So if you look at this kind of light gray boxes here, these are the road verges, um, the diversity of um, um, species and abundance of bumblebees when compared to the fields. So you can see in every um, occasion, um, bumblebees abundance was much higher on the road verge. So this is, um, it's been around for a while, but there is nothing really new. I mean, it has received a, a, a great deal of uh, media interest and uh, a lot of public interest in road verges, but it has been, been for a while, people recognize the importance of road verges. Uh, at the moment, they were built in large scale, starting in the late 60s when we had the major revamp of the, uh, in the building of the motorways across the country. So one of the things is before we start working at the soft estate, we need to know what there is. So botanical surveys are quite important. So we do find information in a number of different ways at the moment. This is uh, talking about highways England and the uh, strategic growth network. So there are a number of ways that we do find uh, information and collect this information. And we now have the uh, environmental information system, which is uh, an internal database where we collect and collate all the information uh, from around our network. So once we collect information, we can start thinking about mapping and plotting them out and see where they are so that we can actually start managing them accordingly. So we know where we have these amazing meadows, which this one is on the A38, just on Dart Bridge Junction which some of you might be quite familiar with it. We kind of identify where all the nasty species, like this one I wanted to bring up, which is the um, winter heliotropes, Petrocytis fragrance, which is, the, um, is taking over uh, many of our road verges because of its uh, invasive nature. And uh, as with it, we kind of identify areas where we could potentially improve or enhance. We identify areas where we kind of uh, if I had potential hazards to passing uh, traffic and other um, work that needs doing like uh, woodland management such as thinning and uh, woodland creation. So management is just is really really important for road verges because if you think of it it's uh, entirely uh, man-made habitat and it's pretty much very dynamic. Um, it's um, in most cases it's rich in nutrients it um, has all the exposure to the sun, so things grow very quickly. And very quickly, you can lose your grasslands, uh, all the, uh, such as the sort of marsh is here being spotted by scrub. And things like ditches here, where you can get uh, encroachment very quickly. And then you have kind of dead trees, like this one is uh, near Junction of Dean Pryor in the 38 and then over time, trees can easily overhang live carriageways and things. So this is kind of quite important for the safety uh, aspect as well as, uh, as it's kind of a biodiversity value as well. So here in the Southwest, we've been working with something we call the uh, Grassland uh, Management Plan, which is um, we, where we collate all of the information and then we put into our GIS based system. So this is quite important to have. It's just an inventory of things that you have. Uh, it highlights locations of invasive species such as uh, Japanese knotweed, uh, Himalayan balsam, uh, but the locations of um, notable protected or in rare species. So it is quite interesting because um, and quite an efficient tool because with all that information in there, we are able to pass on really simple, straightforward maps to contractors and people that can actually go out and do the work. So you can put in really simple um, work prescriptions in there, like um, control traveler's joys and butlia, uh, cut and rake here and there. This is the junction, uh, the center junction on the 830, uh, just outside of Hale. Uh, this road here will take you to St. Ives. So it is quite important, simple, and the good the good thing about it is that you can um, you can cost it quite efficiently as well. 
So there are a number of things when it comes to management that you have to bear in mind. Um, it's, it's how easy is it? Do you have a, a, an issue with access? Because I mean, we're talking about kind of a roadside management at the industrial scale here. So it's uh, it's really important that you have all the uh, these things kind of uh, raised and mapped out and uh, addressed, such as this uh, grassland. This one is quite nice, just outside Marsh Mills in Plymouth. It's really, really nice. But the problem to manage here in today's health and safety uh, requirements, you need to close two lanes. So management can be these can easily be quite expensive. And uh, at this part of the network, you can only do the work at night as well because of traffic management restrictions. And the other thing is you, you know where your nice species are or things that you want to look, uh, uh, look after and preserve. So you know how to time your operations. You know what time of uh, machinery there is required. So there are quite a few things that you need to take in mind, to bear in mind. And also, um, on the urban parts of the network, you can't really work at night. So there's loads of things that you need to kind of um, uh, bear in mind. And once you do, you cut and collect what you do with your risings. So is the timing um, of the operations uh, suitable? Like you don't want to be cutting this here now in the early spring when the, the, the ground is covered in the uh, uh, and the early flowering species like primroses and, and uh, cowslips, etc. So, do you require um, uh, ecological supervision or any other type of uh, supervision? But then, for every uh, for every job, there is the right tool. This is a a, a a a model of a cut and collect machine. This one was built by one of our contractors in early. I think it must have been two thousand and three or four. So what you do have is a flail and a vacuum that actually cuts the grass and collects everything into the back of a, a trailer. And this is a much more modern version. Uh, this is a Dutch machine. And I photographed this one in Belgium a few years ago. And they're really highly efficient because the back of the, uh, the trailer actually compacts all the rising that uh, it collects along the way. So now things are getting um, quite fancy. Some of these are extremely um, efficient and very expensive machines. But then there are a number of other things that we can use and we have used in the past, like this, uh, that it's got like a really powerful engine and uh, it's great for scrub clearance. You've got a slightly older kind of cut and collect system. It kind of cuts and uh, collects into this box, which you can empty um, nearby. And then obviously there are streamers, and this is the most uh, kind of recently uh, quite popular on road voyages now because they're really safe to use, uh, are the uh, remote control mowers. And some of them actually have a um, mechanical rake where you can adapt in the, uh, uh, the head. And then if you're more the traditional type, then there is always grazing, which is incredible. Unfortunately, it's, uh, it's something that we can't use on, on road verges everywhere yet, but we are, it's something that we're looking seriously at uh, increasing the amount of um, our verges that are managed by grazing. So biodiversity in the soft seat is incredible i mean a lot of people will miss most things because we so we drive uh, we always in a rush and we drive in at 70 miles an hour we tend to kind of uh, miss most things that uh, all these photographs are, are here in devon and cornwall so all of these things are there at the moment so it kind of highlights the potential and actually highlights the how precarious the surrounding landscape and the state of nature is because they choose to live in a place that kind of, uh, it can be quite dangerous and noisy and you know, kind of a lot of light disturbance as well. But this thing is there, the potential is there and it's amazing when you, when you actually get to see this. Um, if you ignore the noise and, um, and the traffic, it's just, uh, it's amazing. It's just quite incredible. And the whole thing, the real challenge is to have that into this sort of context, because some of our roads, they see incredibly high um, amounts of traffic. And many of our work has actually had to be done at night because it's the only time we can actually uh, have a, a road uh, or a lane closure. And road verges, because they're road verges, they're constantly under attack. Um, so we get low fires. Uh, I, 
pretty much seen one of my really nice orchid sites being cremated by a, a, a lorry on fire along day 30 not long ago this was um, at the site near Boventa in Cornwall um, and uh, I haven't been back uh, yet, this year yet but uh, last year I had only one species of orchids back so I lost two at that event um, a lot of our services, like uh, the telecoms and gas, actually, they uh, are buried uh, next to roadside. So people come in and dig new trenches or they have to repair. Or So at the same time, this is a perfect kind of uh, opportunity to spread invasive species like Japanese knotweed, or in this case, uh, Pitocytis fragrance, because it's um, it will quite easily um, spread by rhizomes. Litter is another huge problem that we have. Um, it's it's a lot of it and very frequently. So it's really difficult to keep an eye on that. And uh, along trunk roads, it's the responsibility of local authorities and not many of them actually equipped to deal with this amount of litter and where it is because you, you need specific uh, special vehicles and uh, training to stop and collect all the litter. And things will vary from kind of chocolate wraps uh, to fridge freezers and um, wardrobes and <laughs> double beds and that sort of stuff. Um, the other thing that we have is uh, road verges are actually perfect um, habitat for many noxious and invasive species. Um, and because of their high nutrient contents on soil, they spread quite happily. And we do have spillages, and some of them are, can be really annoying, and um, it can be anything because everything now is, is carried over our road. So the diesel, chemicals, uh, milk. I think one of the most difficult spillages they had to deal with was chocolate because they transport chocolate warm in these massive uh, tankers. So one in a cold night, one of them went over, and the, the chocolate spilled over, and... Um, it became, we got sorted quite quickly in contact with the uh, road surface and it took them a long time to actually clean it up. But that doesn't stop us to kind of uh, maximize the, uh, the potential of our verges to, um, to biodiversity. So uh, a few years ago, we carried out a study here in the southwest. This is um, along 40 sites, 42 sites in Devon Cornwall, verges of uh, varying uh, int uh, botanical interest. And uh, we came up with a, a, a quite a lot of different um, pollinators. Especially, it was a it was a study focused on pollinators, but we did collect a, a number of other uh, species of terrestrial invertebrates. So this came in total covered. They found eight, 866 uh, different taxa, including uh, 32 uh, different species of bees, 16 nationally scarce species, four species of principal importance and one endangered species. And I think one of the things is really, because not many people are looking at uh, road verges yet, I think we, the things will probably uh, change in the next uh, 10 years or so. So this was, a, was quite incredible, a good finding. So we do have a little bit of money uh, every year for biodiversity improvements. Um, and one of the things for me was to actually find uh, where we could get the most of our money, um, where we can create habitat or where we can enhance the uh, connectivity potential of our road verges. So we did a, a study, it's kind of another GIS exercise. So we collected all the data that we had, threw into the computer. Uh, we used a lot of LIDAR uh, and aerial photography. Uh, with that, uh, we were able to identify key areas within the soft state that could benefit from um, um, habitat creation and maybe used as, uh, be, uh, used as a stepping stones for uh, species. So, Using that example, we um, this map here kind of highlights all the uh, the key uh, pollinating species, including butterflies and bees, moths, um, and uh, the darker it is, the better the higher the permeability uh, in grasslands. So with this area here, which is roughly between Ivy Bridge and Ashburton, identify potential um, grassland creation schemes. 
because you have to take into, uh, into a, a lot into consideration such as practicality and can you actually park can you do you work on the verges can you cut and collect so there are a number of different things that you have to take into account so species rich uh, grassland creation i've been doing this for several years um, and i have been doing one way i've been doing this is uh, by um, harvesting uh, material on species rich grassland like this one was uh, on, on the A30 near Oakhampton. Uh, we we own a, a few acres of uh, species rich grassland in the field. So, what we did, we collected, uh, we cut the material, uh, collected all that green hay. This was cut as a, a late July, early August to maximize viable seeds. So, once we did that we spread the material on prepared ground so all that green hay being spread and what we end up with is a replica of the meadow pretty much a replica of the meadow that you, you started off with or the, uh, the, the, the material that the donor site so some of the species they take slightly longer but um, in the long term um, you start seeing um, many many similarities between the donor site and the receptor sites so we have been doing regularly this now, not with this, not just with this uh, method, but we using seeds, local gather seeds, and there are a number of um, schemes um, starting in the next five years or so in the southwest. So this was one of the the latest schemes. This one was on the A38 between Ivy Bridge and um, Ashburton. So I named that one turning A roads into B routes. So we started off with verges like this. This was taken in the spring. This was late. Um, this was May 2017. 2000 and, yeah, 17, 18. And uh, this is a section of the verge with very little dominated by um, um, fossil grass and typical MG1 type of grasslands, uh, really rank, uh, lots of gorse and bramble. So what we did with that, with using that system, kind of preparing, treating a lot of the uh, the bramble and stuff ahead in advance of the scheme, we're actually able to turn into something like that. So using uh, seeds this time from a, a, an ancient meadow in Devon. So we did that for miles in the uh, the, the impact is quite magnificent. Um, it's the, the visual uh, attraction of it is beautiful. And the nice thing is this is kind of pretty much south facing here. And the other side was kind of flowering at the latest stage. So we had this for the, uh, the northbound here, the A38 flowering first, followed by that, which is quite interesting. Um, and this was actually quite fantastic. And um, for me, the, the whole thing was, uh, was aimed at uh, biodiversity, especially uh, it's kind of promoting biodiversity on, on the verges, but I never really expect the impact they had on people. So we had so many uh, people ringing in and thank, you know, thanking for the work. And um, it, it just highlights how important and how connected we are with our natural uh, surroundings. So there are a number of other things that we have done. Uh, this is a, a tree study, which is a software that we use to assess uh, ecosystem services. And it's a quite important tool because it puts a, uh, a value to the ecosystem services. So this is just on the 838 west of Exeter. We came up with a figure of 303,000 trees. And these are the main species, Ashfield, Maple and Sycamore. And then it tells kind of things like a pollution removal that these uh, these assets have uh, can have the potential to, to remove from the environment, carbon storage, things like avoided runoff, which is quite fantastic, and then the amenity value. Um, and one that I kind of like is the screening value. So if you had to replace the trees with a, a similar fence or something like that, to screen the road from uh, near side residents. Um, another scheme which is quite interesting is this is a, a, a bypass, uh, Bodmin to Indian Queens bypass on, on the A30. And uh, all this area here is a triple SI, so Goss and Tregoss Moors, uh, it's, it's now called um, Mid Cornwall Moors, um, where the um, marsh fertility, um it was quite uh, one, one of the main uh, species there. So we 
trying to boost the habitat within that area. What we did, again, we use our habitat connectivity model. So these are the areas. Uh, this is roughly where Gross Moor is, um, and which they were extinct for a few years at the end of 2010 until recently. They've been found recorded again. So what we wanted to do is to link this population. So we used the modeling and then identified areas that could benefit from further planting of devil's pit scabies, which is the food plant for the caterpillar. So we collected seeds. Uh, this was a, an exercise between uh, Natural England and How is England staff. We collected loads of seeds. We handed them uh, over to uh, the Eden project, which then created the plug plants. And then um, two years later, I think out of the 10,000 plugs, we planted at about 9,850, managed to establish well. And uh, uh, it's quite interesting to see um, late in September, October. So we're now hoping, I couldn't go there uh, last year, but I'm, I'm hoping to see some, really hoping to see some uh, marsh fritillary caterpillars there. That would be amazing. So the other thing that we do quite and we have to work with and around is um, the hazel dormouse. Um, this is a kind of a distribution map using our records and the existing surrounding records uh, using our um, habitat connectivity tool. And one thing that we realized that they're quite happy. They really like, they're really keen on the fast lane and they will nest very close to road verges. You not only um, build it with the summer nest, but they will actually hibernate uh, next to the roads. So we got hibernation nests in there as well. So this is great to have them. And then the, obviously it's a, a, a great uh, opportunity to actually boost habitat connectivity, not just for dormice, but for uh, birds and bats. So again, we're using our tool and look, looking at the practicality size of it. Uh, we've been doing a lot of tree planting recently. So basically, so we want to enhance the potential here, uh, connectivity potential along the verges. And this is particularly important where you have really leg hedges um, in the surrounding land. So this is kind of establishing quite well, and I'm hoping this will green over very quickly in the next couple of growing seasons. So obviously this is a, a, a reason of concern because um, in the spirit of how is England's um, internal uh, safety campaign, we have to look after the dormice as well. So we've been looking at a way to keep them safe. So the question that we have is, uh, are we on the right road? Are we on the right direction in, in order to accommodate biodiversity and, and wildlife on our verges? Um, I think one of the, the main challenges is we need to challenge the way we have done things so far, uh, because at the moment uh, we, we come to a point that we need to start thinking seriously about how to integrate um, nature uh, and, and wildlife in our uh, road designs and road maintenance. And the idea is not just keep that within the road corridor, but the, the whole point is to actually uh, influence people so that they can do this in the garden, um, with the local school, uh, the, the open green spaces or anywhere where they can promote nature. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite positive and I think I've been doing this job for long enough to see that a lot has changed. And uh, I think one of the main things that has changed is the interest in road verges. Because in the, when I started, this is kind of, it was before it was fashionable. When you say, oh, what have you been doing? I've been writing a management plan for the M5 between Tewkesbury and, uh, and Shelton. And people, oh, but why do I bother? And I said, well, you know, that, that's the thing. There, there, there are lots of potential in there. And uh, I'm really glad that this uh, has happened. And um, I hope that this, uh, that this enthusiasm and this interest will only grow in the future. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Leo. That was really interesting. We've had loads and loads of questions come through and it's really, um, really good to, to hear the story and the management behind those scenes that we see when we're driving up and down the A38. So we've got quite a lot of questions, which we'll save for, for the end. Um, so in the meantime, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Kate. So Kate Petty um, is the Road Verge campaign manager at the Wild 
plant charity, but uh, plant life, sorry, Kate there. <laughs> She's worked at Plant Life since October 2018. And as part of the Road Verge campaign, Kate works with councils, community groups, contractors, and statutory and highways agencies to see road verges better managed for wildflowers and the wildlife they support. Um, so welcome, welcome, Kate. Good evening, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much uh, for the invitation to to come and speak tonight. It's as Leo has been saying in, in your introduction at the beginning, Tracy. It's so wonderful to see um, the masses of enthusiasm and interest in in species rich grassland, in, in meadows, and in, in road verges uh, at the moment. Um, and at Plant Life, we're, we're we're dedicated to conserving the UK's wild plants and fungi. So it's it's a, a Real pleasure to have this opportunity to, to chat to you all this evening and hopefully in, inspire and, and empower you to, to get involved in, in transforming road verges um, for, for wildlife. So the plant life started the road verge campaign back in 2013, um, really in response to verges being mown down in, in full flower um, and the disparity between what um, verges could be versus what um, all too frequently that they were becoming um, and, and since that time there's sort of really been two things that, that are central to the campaign. Um, one of those is the advice and, and the guidance that, that we provide um, and the second one is, is really um, the, the petition to councils um, asking councils to, and, and landowners to, to um, change the way that they, they manage road verges to wildlife and that's really captured the, the public interest and now that's been signed over 127,000 times now and and back when I joined the campaign in 2018 um, thanks to funding from the Prince of Wales's charitable fund um, that's really allowed the campaign itself to, to blossom and has allowed us to to work more with councils and, and highways organizations and local groups to create um, more partnerships um, around the UK to really um, kickstart um, more of this transformation of road verges across the country. And a lot of the work that the campaign has been has been doing is really to raise awareness of the importance of, of these wonderful habitats and to change perceptions of, of what verges can be. Um, as as already has been you know, noted tonight, meadows are becoming so increasingly rare. We've lost so many of them and many people won't have had the chance to experience that or may have not grown up knowing what, what road verges can be like or rather presume all they can be is uh, litter strewn thickets or, or um, sort of really highly manicured um, lawn like grass areas as well. Um, I've, I've mentioned it and it's been mentioned before we're, we're making a lot of noise about road verges at the moment and really why why do they matter so much and one thing road verges really are as diverse in their nature as, as the landscapes that they pass through across the country and over 700 species of, of wildflower can can be found on verges um, and that's nearly 45 percent of the, the total flora of the UK some of those of course uh, are your very common species, your, your daisies and your dandelions, um, but others are incredibly rare, like the Deptford Pink or, or Fen Ragwort, which can now only be found on, on road verges. And as Tracy said at the beginning, we've lost um, 97, 98% of our wildflower meadows since the 1930s. So road verges really are now this really vital refuge for so many um, wildflowers. And as we like to say, a plant life where wildflowers lead, wildlife follows, and um, road verges support such a wealth of, of other biodiversity, your bees, bugs, birds, bats and butterflies, they all rely on, on these wonderful habitats. Often we, we do focus on biodiversity and the innate value of, of plants themselves, but as Leo has mentioned, road verges um, can also provide a wealth of benefits in terms of ecosystem services. So for example, a, a well-managed verge can really 
um, lock in, it can sequester carbon into the verge. And verges can act as, as buffers to, to noise and air pollution and increasingly um, well-being as well. For, for some people, as, as Leo said, verges are their only connection to nature really as they drive or walk past. And we're increasingly recognizing how important that connection to, to nature is um, and this sense of really being connected to, to the flowers on the verges on your doorstep has really blossomed I think during lockdown as well where we've been um, forced many of us to, to be stuck in the same place for so long but can actually um, see um, the, the life cycle of those plants and to see that see that flowering happening and see the potential of, of what those verges could be. Unfortunately on a on a sort of wider scale for a great number of years we've created a, a pretty tough situation for verges out there through increased mowing um, or um, not being able to mow enough through increased nitrogen emissions um, and increased fertilizer use and also the, the difficulties of, of budget cuts as well so there's really been a, a perfect storm that's in, engulfed verges um, and because of that plant life um, set out a, a new vision for verges, um, which is one where they're, they're managed with nature in mind um, whilst keeping our roads safe as well. And road verges really are sort of a ready-made network that has great potential to create these wonderful ribbons of grassland or mini meadows on, on verges throughout the country by restoring what we already have and add more and more flower-rich habitats along our verges and to only see to only see verges as, as the piece of land next to a road is is to miss out on a on a really big opportunity so in order to to make the most of this opportunity and um to to see this vision be be realized um at plant life we've um put together these guidance to encourage um management regimes to be changed as well as to inspire people as to what verges can be and to, to foster a love um, of these plants and all the wildlife that grow on these important habitats. And this practical guidance sets out a different approach to management and this different approach um, is one that can really transform the whole veg network, not just isolated pockets. Um, and this is a great way to improve not only biodiversity, but to also make our reverge management regimes more sustainable and more cost efficient over time as well. So we have two guides that are, are freely available um, on the Plant Life website. Um, the first of those is the Good Veg Guide. This was the first guide that we published um, and we've just um, reissued a new edition earlier this year. Um, this really is the, a, a go-to guide for, for all things verges, all of your different types of verges, um, verge habitat, so grass verges, woodland verges, urban verges. It also includes information on um, sowing wildflower seeds and it has answers to some of the most um, frequently asked questions that we get um, through to the campaign. Then the second document that was published back in September 2019, which already seems a lifetime ago, doesn't it? But um, this guide is, is more of a, a technical guide, a best practice guide that was put together through um, a cross-sector partnership effort involving national highways organisations like Highways England. Leo was, was also involved in the partnership group that put this together. Um, it also um, involved um, some of the big contractors, Skanska and Kia, who, who carry out um, some of the, the road verge management across the country. And it also brought together um, other wildlife organisations, the wildlife trusts and butterfly conservation um, to bring together, um, to coalesce around this, this new guidance to, to deliver a, a transformation of verges across the country. So I'm going to give you um, a, a whistle-stop tour through, through some of the guidance, um, pulling out some of the, the key principles behind creating great verges, some of the different management scenarios, and to share some of um, the top tips that, that we've gathered um, from working with councils and community groups across the country. So to start off, um, some of the, the key principles for creating great grassland um, 
great grassland verges. So the, the first of those is um, annual management. Um, this um, is, is really so important. So studies of, of meadow management has, has shown that uh, no cutting and cutting too much can, can both cause problems for um, species rich grassland. So without regular management, the thicker grasses can, can quickly dominate. They can become your thugs of the verge and, and crowd out um, many of the delicate wildflowers. So in order to maximize the potential of our verges of, of the grassland, um, annual management or, or some sort of cyclical management, maybe every uh, at least every two years is the sort of ideal thing to do um, for these verges. And then the, the second sort of key principle is that um, the timing of this management is really important. And it might seem very obvious to say this, um, but it's really important to let the wildflowers um, complete their life cycle. To, so to grow, flower and set seed before they're cut. And this way, we're, we're really working with nature. Nature's doing a lot of the work for us. The, the seed bank the so in the soil can be replenished and, and natural regeneration can be given a helping hand. Um, so getting the timing is, is right because if, if we cut too early or too frequently or too late, we can quickly get rid of, of so many um, species and to start to reduce the floral diversity and the quality of the verge. So for, for grassland species, which are the, are the options in this table that comes from managing um, grassland road verges, um, the ideal option really is a, is a two-cut management approach which mimics traditional meadow management. So cutting twice a year and collecting the cuttings where you possibly can, and a bit, bit more on that just later. Um, there are different ways and different timings depending on, on your verges, um, the types of species that grow on them, or perhaps where in the country you're based um, because of, of changes in flowering time. But this is a, a good blueprint to work from. Of course, um, there are other options in terms of timings for woodland or shaded verges too, which I'm going to mention a bit later too. So I mentioned it just then, um, the importance of, of removing the, the grass cuttings or, or risings or, or clippings as they're, as they're um, often called in, in different ways. Why is this um, so important? Um, well, low soil fertility is, is really a key thing if you want to improve the wild, wildlife value of your verge and to reduce um, the the burden from management over time. And this is because wildflowers do, do best in low fertility soils. So collecting the grass cuttings, you take away the nutrients and you start to decrease this over time. You also um, remove the thatch of grass that, that can develop. So you're opening up the grassland sward, allowing the more delicate wildflowers to, to thrive and um, when you re repeat this year on year, um, you'll get less grass growth year on year, and therefore sort of reducing the management burden. And um, I know that's all very well to, to say, but how on earth do you, do you carry that out on a road network? Whereas, as we've heard from Leo, there are such logistical challenges as, as well. And it is a challenge, um, I'm not gonna lie, but it isn't impossible and more and more councils and organizations that are finding ways to bring collection of arisings into their cutting regimes and, and are benefiting in the long term from doing that. So there are lots of ways that this can be done mechanically. Um, in the guidelines, there's, it goes through different types of, of machinery towards the back. Um, there's everything from your sort of large scale um, suction flail harvesters to um, um, hand controlled motorized um, power tools um, and there's a, a really great video from the Wales Biodiversity Partnership Conference from last year. There was a, a whole session on one afternoon on, on road veg management and there's a great video that was put together by um, local authorities across Wales that looks at the different types of machinery that they're using to, to manage their meadows and their road verges. So I'd really recommend having having a look at that if you want some more detail on the types of machinery you can use. And of course, if you don't have machinery, if that isn't an option and you're looking to do things on a smaller scale, um, a trusty rake and lots of volunteer involvement can get you to the same place. And sometimes it's 
um, useful to know that it's not necessarily removing the grass cuttings completely from the verge. Sometimes they can be collected up to make habitat piles in the verge or, or moved to, to the back part of the verge. And, and that works quite well as well. So moving on to the, the different scenarios that, that you might find. And this one, um, enhancing amenity verges links quite nicely into um, the, the previous slide on um, co the collection of grass cuttings. So collecting grass cuttings in this way through cut and collect as is, is shown in, in the photo here, can be a great way to enhance um, your amenity verges. Currently, amenity grassland might not have much biodiversity value, but it has a lot of potential for, for improving biodiversity and the, the visual appearance of verges as well. Equipment like this does cost money, of course, but several councils are um, using invest to, to save budgets or um, uh, budgets um, that are linked to um, having declared a climate emergency or a biodiversity crisis um, to invest in this type of machinery. There's a great case study from Dorset Council who, do, who developed a business case around buying this kit because it's um, significantly reduced their management burdens both in time in in terms of time and money um, this sort of kit as mentioned probably works best on in urban locations um, so for example in Dorset where they were once cutting 12 times a year um, through implementing cut and collect like this they now are managing these sorts of uh, urban verges and amenity verges now only sort of two to three times a year. So having a verge that is um, quite tightly mown, it's quite sh a short sword, can actually be good, good for biodiversity and wildflowers. Um, and you can also benefit this by reducing the frequency of the cuts. Um, and this in turn can help um, the flowers to, to grow back and to sort of better support um, the wildlife on the verges. Um, Open grass verges are likely to be the, the main type of verge you might come across. Um, many of these um, have, have suffered from either too much cutting or um, conversely under management, um, but they can be restored with um, some, some tender loving road verge management. Um, you'll probably need to sort of invest in a, a short burst of intensive management on these verges initially to sort of reinstate the grassland areas if, if grassland is, is what your, your goal is at the end of it, um, and also to sort of kickstart a reduction in soil fertility as well. So on these sorts of verges, you might look to, to cut and collect the arisings more than once or twice in the first year, maybe clearing some scrub as well. Um, but these costs that you might have to invest can probably be recouped over three to five years and then by implementing a good management regime, you can continue to reduce costs and benefits in the medium to long term. And there are two things um, to keep in mind when, when restoring um, or improving the quality of verges like this. First of those, that um, if you're involved in meadow management, you're likely to be um, familiar with already, which is yellow rattle, um, our, our favorite um, meadow, maker, meadow maker plant. Um, that for those of you who don't know is a, is a semi-parasitic plant that um, reduces grass growth. Um, so this can really help to open up the verge, allowing wildflowers to thrive. Um, and of course, the reduced grass growth means um, less need to, to cut the grass too. And if you want to um, know more about yellow rattle specifically, um, there's uh, a web page um, on the on the main plant life website dedicated to, to yellow rattle, and all of the sort of links I've mentioned will either be going around in the in the chat now or, or will be sent around for you afterwards. Um, and then the second one to mention is is bare ground. So by scarifying the verge, either when it's cut or or prior to reseeding. Um, can really open the verge up, allow bare earth, which is great for the new germ germination and the establishment of new wildflowers, um, and is also a great thing for, for insect life too. The third management scenario or scenario you might find um, is 
maintaining and restoring um, species rich verges. These are of course verges that are already high quality and support lots of wildlife already and, and these sites offer um, the, the maximum biodiversity value when, when they're managed and, and well maintained. Like any grassland, you know, these sites need some sort of annual management to, to keep them in good, good shape and, and collection of cuttings to keep the soil fertility low. Um, often these really are your, are your local wildlife sites, your protected verges or your special verges. They're called slightly different things in every county. Um, and often these verges will need specialist management. So your, your local ecologist um, or your local botanist will, will know best because sometimes they do have rare species, not just rare plant species, um, and they'll need that, that specialist advice for management. They can quickly lose their, their wild, wildlife value if, if they aren't managed well, but these sites can often be, be brought back simply by restarting a good management um, regime like we've talked about already. Um, because a lot of the time the, the plants are still there in the sward, or the seed is still there in the in the seed bank. So by managing it correctly, um, you can wait and see what will start to come back, and hopefully your your verge will start to, to bounce back into life when it's managed well. And Leah's already talked about the importance of mapping your your sites and knowing what you have, where you have it. So by mapping these sites and clearly marking them, that can be a great help when it comes to the tricky logistics of of managing a whole county or a whole network of verges. And then the, the fourth um, scenario you might find yourself in or, or, or want to get involved with is um, the creation of new species rich verges. So on uh, brand new earthworks or on brand new road development, these can be a really cost effective and sustainable use of the new verges that have been created, not only by helping the road blend into the, the landscape, but they're a really important way of creating more species rich grassland, which is um, declined so much in, in the UK. And by, by planning early, um, you'll save costs and, and management um, uh, that's required over time. Um, and this is because the sort of real guiding principle to creating species rich verges is to avoid the use of, of fertile topsoil by using hardly any um, fertile topsoil, you won't be continually fighting the, the regrowth of, of rich grass. Um, and if you're looking of a, for a great example of, of how this has been done in practice, then do have a look at the, the Weymouth Relief Road, which is championed a lot and deservedly so because it's a, a brilliant example for this. There are lots of different methods that, that you can use to create new verges, whether that's um, a brand new verge or whether it's um, creating a species rich verge from a, a verge that is currently species poor. So that might be working with natural colonization if your new verge is, is nearby a species rich verge, or it might be natural seeding like um, green hay from a, a freshly harvested meadow as, as Leo's already talked about as well. Um, Sometimes bought seed mixes might be your, your only option. And in, in that case, we'd always recommend um, our keeping the wild in wildflower advice. Um, so using British seed and as seed that's as sourced as, as locally as, as possible and, and suitable for the area to keep the distinctiveness of, of the natural flora. And there's lots more info um, on sowing seeds, um, especially in urban areas in um, the new edition of the Good Verge Guide, as well as in the Managing Grassland Road Verges Guide as well. So I've talked um, uh, up till now about mostly grassland verges, but of course, um, other types of verge are available. Um, so what if you have a, a woodland or a shaded verge, what should you do then? Often these verges um, are rich in early flowering, woodland species, your, your primroses, your bluebells and your ramsons, and often they have thin grass growth too, so they often don't need cutting very often. So often these, these verges don't need cutting between January and, and mid-July, um, but some sort of cutting annually can help keep overgrowth of, of brambles and, and scrub at bay. 
and you can treat um, sort of steep shaded lane sides in the same way as this as well. Um, and often because you have little grass growth, you don't really need to worry so much about collecting the risings that, that come from this as well. So to, to start to finish off, um, just to, to share with you some of the, the top tips um, that, that um, uh, are really useful um, and that we've we've gathered from, from different councils and groups across the country. Um, the first of these is, is what we like to call the biodiversity buzz cut. Now, often people think verges have to be long to be wildlife friendly, but as I briefly mentioned earlier around amenity grassland and urban verges, low growing verges can be rich in short growing wildflower species that are really brilliant for pollinators. So by cutting verges around three to six centimeter cutting height about every month, about six weeks, this can this buzz cut approach can be really useful in areas where you have concerns um, about longer grass, whether that's um, concerns from perceptions um, around it, you know, not being neat and tidy or, or a messier look, um, or where people need access to verges or access to green space, or where there are a safety um, concerns as well. So adopting this approach around junctions, along sight lines and in safety areas can leave you that double win-win of, of delivering safe roads, but also having the biodiversity benefits as, as well. Then the, another great tip um, that, that lots of people are implementing, as you can see in, in the pictures here, um, is, is framing verges. And this can really, again, help with tackling negative perceptions around changes in management and also communicating the change that's happening too. So by framing the verges, we, we simply mean cutting the first metre or the first swathe cut of your verges, um, your sort of one mower width along the front of your edge of your verges and this really keeps the verges looking uh, tidier it makes it helps people know that um, the longer grass is being left intentionally and the verges aren't being neglected um, and it also has two other really important benefits it helps to, to keep roads safe it preserves good road visibility um, and can ensure safety at junctions for example um, and it also creates a really nice structural diversity in your verge so it helps to, to keep variety in your verge, which is great. So you have some shorter growing grass and longer growing grass into sort of shrubs and trees if your verge is, is wide enough to achieve that. And that's great not only for the different types of plants that it would support, but for the, the different types of insects that, that it would help support as well. And then the, the third top tip um, is around communication and engagement. And these are these are really important things, and it's really fantastic to see that you know the growing awareness and interest in in the natural world and attitudes are changing. But um, it can really help the the success of a project to to communicate what is happening instead of just say leaving it um, leaving it to grow and not telling anybody about that. Um, so there have been fantastic examples in in recent years. Um, from councils and community groups of the signage um, that has been used on road verges to, to show that management is intentional and to really communicate the importance of it and to help people get involved and feel a part of that as well. Um, there are also great examples of local, local groups and the development of council and community initiatives um, collectively um, to, to help increase the, the wildlife value of verges. So that people getting involved in working with their councils, whether that's um, in the collection of, of grass cuttings where it's safe to do so, whether it's sowing yellow rattle or, or wildflower seed, or conducting even botanical surveys on verges. So just um, I just wanted to quickly share with you some some good examples, some good news stories of, of what's happening around the country. There's so much going on, um, and it's wonderful to see. Um, so to, to pull out, I think, a few things for you um, in Denbyshire, in, in North East Wales, now nearly 80 percent of the Verge Network is on a biodiversity, a biodiversity cut. So it's cut 
um, once a year after um, August, and increasingly they're, they're looking to um, use cut, cut and collect on, on their network to improve the condition of, of verges. Um, and they're sort of doing that in a, in a, in a planned way. Um, and they're also mapping um, the verge network to have a look at, um, uh, to, to identify suitable areas to create new wildflower rich verges. Um, there are other schemes around the country, like uh, the Get Bath Buzzing campaign to manage verges and green space better for pollinators. Um, down in Cornwall, the council have uh, started to invest in, in cut and collect machinery following Dorset's great example. Um, several councils, Derbyshire and, and Cheshire and Cheshire West, for example, have, have started consultations um, with residents on grassland and, and um, wildflower management. Um, lots of different councils are starting um, grass cutting trials, for example, in, in Essex and also in the east of England over in Cambridge. Um, the council has just announced a, a new management plan for the whole county, which is, is brilliant. And other councils are, are adopting um, uh, Plant Life's No My May campaign, for example, uh, Cardiff Council and Thanet down in Kent have just announced that they're going to be doing that this year, which is which is great to see. Um, and then on a, on a national scale, Highways England announced just before Christmas um, that they're going to be implementing a new low nutrient soil policy on, on their new grassland verges along new roads, which is all the sort of low nutrient um, soil fertility and, and not putting topsoil back on, which is which is fantastic to see. And as as well as the sort of changes at a national level and, and the council level, um, it's really wonderful to see so much happening at the, the grassroots level. Um, with everything you know, sort of you're doing down in in Devon with more meadows and the Life on the Verge um, biosphere project. Um, there's so much happening with with local groups getting involved. So just to highlight a few others here that um, might be uh, a, a, an inspiration for you. So we have um, Restoring Shropshire's Verges Project from, from Shropshire, funnily enough. Um, Verging on Wild from, from Herefordshire. Um, the Worcester Environmental Group, Wildflower Lewis down in East Sussex and On the Verge Sterling. And there's also a sister, a sister group of sorts, another On the Verge that's based in Cambridge as well. And, and this is only a handful. There are more groups popping up um, and we're having more conversations with, with um, people across the country. So in Warwickshire, in, in Powys, down in Hampshire as well. So much is going on, which is wonderful to see. And all of these sorts of groups are in discussions with councils at different, different levels, from the parishes through district and boroughs up to the county level. Um, so really making a contact with your your council, councillors, your elected representatives is a great way to go if you're if you're looking to get started in your local area. Um, all of these groups as well have, have invested in some really great signage and logos and are active in their communities and, and online via social media too. And they're working on a on a great variety of different projects from surveying special verges um, to sewing yellow rattle and collecting cuttings. So really working with the council on um, communicating what communities want to see in, in their local area um, and to reassuring them really that um, having a, a wild and more wildlife friendly approach is, is really wanted. And I know often it can seem like there's there's a lot in the guidance and there's a big buzz around road wedges at the moment, but goodness me, like where to start? Um, and really don't set yourself an uphill struggle um choose the the areas of verges or whether that's the verges in your area or, or verges across your whole network that are the, are the easiest parts to start with so your whether that's a flatter verge or, or a wider verge start there and or, or work outwards from your most sort of top quality verges and and plan your, your restorations in stages don't try and feel that you have to tackle everything all at once because um, you can start restoring your key structures of verges and then from there work to create larger and larger areas of better habitat which in the end will also be more efficient um, to, to manage as well and, and nature will help you in, in terms of the natural seeding and the spread of species too and you'll start to 
create this, this larger network and we'll see this wider transformation as well. And of course, you know your, your local veg is um, best. Um, so take our guidance as, as, as a blueprint and bring to it your, your know-how and your skills and, and your local knowledge on, on your doorstep and really use that to create management plans that really engage and, and start to, to, to transform um, the verges in your area and bring back, start to bring back wonderful colour like this um, to our verges. And really together we can we can help to save um, road verge wildflowers um, and to, to transform the network as a whole. And we're more than happy to, to give advice and, and showcase and celebrate ongoing progress. So please do feel free to, to get in touch with us at Plant Life and we're more than happy to help. Um, so thank you very much. Great. Thank you. I'm really inspired even more now. That was really, really good. I'm going to ask, be quite cheeky and just ask you one question before we bring Sarah in. Um, we just wondered how much interest, Kate, that you've had from Devon councils for your scheme. Um, I met with uh, the council team. Goodness, uh, the pandemic has... has changed my perspective of time but I think it was last it was last February um I met with Tom Whitlock from from the council um and had a meeting with with the highways team there and I know that the council having declared a, a climate emergency that there are things starting to happen um but it would be good good to pick that up again and and any and seeing as there's so much support locally on the ground um to to really push that forward Great. Well, to maybe answer that and um, push that forward a little bit more, we've got um, Sarah Jennings to join us, um, who is a senior ecologist at Devon County Council. Hi, Sarah. You made Hi. it. Excellent. Yes, sorry about that. I, I clicked on the wrong link. <laughs> so um, Sarah will hopefully tell you a little bit about the Devon Life on the Verge scheme and I'm just going to put the link for that in the um, comments box so um, you'll have that to be able to um, have a look at while Sarah perhaps gives us a bit of a, a run through. <laughs> okay um, so hi this is very strange isn't it I have no idea who's out there um, so I, I'm Sarah Jennings I'm the county ecologist at Devon County Council I have literally just stepped in to do this this evening so I am not very prepared but I have been involved in verge management for over 10 years in Devon so hopefully I'll be able to answer some of your questions um, and my brief for this from Tracy was this is largely questions and answers is that right so I'm literally going to whiz through just some very basic stuff on what we're doing in Devon um, and unfortunately because because I couldn't get in, I don't know what the previous presenters were saying, which isn't very helpful. Um, so sorry if I overlap a bit, but basically, um, as you probably know from now, Devon County Council is responsible for managing the majority of the road verges in Devon. People don't really realise that. So it's Devon County Council as the Highways Authority. So Leo for Highways England manages um, the trunk roads. So the majority are DCC. Um, until about, I don't know, four or five years ago, we had quite a good um, verge management policy where uh, we have special verges and we cut those late in the year. Um, we then had budget cuts. Um, and so we effectively were following plant life guidance. We stopped cutting verges altogether, um, apart from visibility displays. So we do now only cut verges where there is a visibility issue for health and safety. Um, but things are a bit more complicated than that. So we um, also um, have contracts with parishes and some of the town councils, so Exeter City Council manage their own verges. And obviously farmers might go and cut verges. So we get lots of complaints sometimes about verge cutting that wasn't us. <laughs> so it's a very complicated world out there in terms of verges. Um, so in terms of life on the verge, which is what Tracy's asked me to talk about, um, we have communities have been in touch with me for years wanting to manage verges and we wanted communities to do it but it was very hard because of health and safety issues which i don't know if anyone has touched on yet um but we had a bit of a breakthrough about four years ago when um dcc stopped cutting verges and so highways were a lot keener to involve communities in managing verges and also we set up the road warden scheme highway set up a road warden scheme that some of you from parishes might be involved in so we had a road warden officer who um 
was given uh, health and safety training and responsible for um, salting roads and potholes, but also grass cutting. Um, so if any of you have got a road warden, do talk to them. So, but the road warden scheme meant that we could uh, dovetail on that and uh, sort out the health and safety issues that had been holding us back. So it was at that point that we basically produced the Life on the Verge guidance in Devon, which I hope lots of you, we have tried to do lots of publicity. Tom Whitlock, who was just mentioned, has been doing lots of work on this for the last few years and talking to parishes and doing um, going to highways parish events um, and talking about it at various events that we've been running. Um, and we have produced, um, so uh, Tracy has sent a link, I think, I'll just hold it up. So we produced this guidance document that basically just talks you through the key steps that you have to go through if you want to manage your verges. So do take a look at it. it um, we need to update it a bit, but it does give you the basics. Um, so the first step is to contact the DCC environment team. So that was Tom Whitlock. Um, he is now passing this over um, to a new member of staff, um, Mike, who is going to be here tonight. Um, and so we can give you those contact details through Tracy. Um, it's then you can chat to us about The Verge and the health and safety issues and the e-learning that we have on our website, just to ensure that you know what to do. Um, so you have to go through these health and safety. It's an e-learning course. I don't think it takes very long, but it lets you know whether it will be safe to manage the verges. So there are lots of verges that we can't let you manage, such as the North Devon Link Road, because it's just too dangerous. Um, so you have to go through this bit of training and then you'll be aware of what you have to do and it might be that you need somebody with what's called chapter eight training to uh, set up the road safety measures um, and your road warden would have chapter eight training um, and you then uh, once we have the okay that it's safe we need to speak to the neighborhood highways officer to check that they don't cut that bit of the verge because if they're going to cut it anyway there's no point in you managing it for wildlife um, and also do we just need them on board generally uh, and Basically, that's it. So we then have lots of stuff about, you know, check what you've got there first. Don't just, you know, I'm sure you've gone through all of this already tonight. Um, don't just storm in and chuck wildflower mix everywhere because we don't want generic species mixes. We want to try and promote what we already might have on that verge. Um, so lots of people want easy wins, which isn't necessarily the best way to go for wildlife. Um, thinking about protected species issues. So we have lots of dormice, obviously, across Devon if you're doing scrub clearance. Um, yeah, and then we have links to the plant life guidance as well. So that's a really quick run through. And we really, really do need your feedback. So um, we're working with lots of community groups across the county. We have very limited resource. Um, so but we do need your feedback to know how this is working. That's it. Great. Whistle stop tour. Yes. So I've been involved with our um, local verges here and it's been quite an interesting process partly because we've had all the COVID restrictions when, which came in pretty much when we started off. So we've been doing lots of solitary surveying and things whilst walking dogs and, and whatnot. But um, yeah, there was a few quite common questions that have come back to me through the forum actually, and through email questions from people all over Devon that are quite keen to start. But I think it's those first steps. They've probably seen a verge been worried that it's been cut at the wrong time or just have a passion to go out and do something um one of the things was do you have to be part of a, a community group or a parish council how how does that work do you have to be a sort of established group to be able to to, to start on that process uh, no i mean and so you could be an individual we've got individuals who are going out and managing verges um so no the the in, the most important thing from the DCC perspective is that you just take a look on our website and go through the steps in the guidance so that health and safety is sorted and you don't start managing a verge which is going to be cut because you'll just then get very angry. <laughs> yeah, so a couple of questions you've answered. So um, you've said about the start points. Um, and those kind of first steps. So if you've kind of gone through those steps with, with Devon County, um, I'm aware, I know when we looked at some of ours that Devon County Council owned some of the verges, but some of them were owned by various landowners. Um, so do you need permissions from all of those people before you can start down that route? How do you so, kind of- Yeah, so the situation is quite- complicated but I mean basically if you then Devon County Council is responsible for the highway surface and 
for the highway. So if you've got two hedges, we are responsible for the area between the hedges, but it's, it's quite complicated. So you absolutely need to speak to us, but obviously you might have a farmer who is managing that verge um, or somebody else who's taken on responsibility for that. So yeah, you know, talk to us, and but also talk to anybody else. You know, your parish council who might have taken on management of the verge, any local farmers, you know, anybody else who might be involved. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise it might just get cut at the wrong time. Yeah. So, is is there a is there a route to find out who landowners are if you can't you know do it by just asking around? Is that something that's quite difficult to do? Um, not that I am aware of. I know that that is pretty difficult, isn't it, through, you know, land registry and everything else, so, and data protection. Um, so I would say that, you know, the community groups will have much more an idea of who the landowners are than, than we will probably, and that we have data protection issues anyway. So, um, yeah. Sorry. I think one of, one of the routes that was suggested to us is that sometimes your town councils or your parish councils can maybe do that on your behalf if they support you know the project or whatever but uh, that's maybe a route perhaps people could could try yeah um i mean you I'm, don't have to talk i mean if, it, if it's an actual verge then you know the far, the local landowner might not be involved in it at all anyway so uh, Okay. So they are, it's, they are, if they're in within the highway, they are DCC's responsibility, not the farmers, whereas the farmers are responsible for hedges. Yeah, okay. Because <laughs> some of them quite often will cut the verge when they do their hedge, don't they? They seem to drop the flail and run along the... Um, yeah, exactly. Along they don't um, have to do it, they just do it. Yeah, unless they have a contract through the parish, potentially. Yes. OK. So a last question sort of, I guess, around around this. And, and I know from our experience that um, that there is a route through. It sort of seems complicated. But as you say, if you follow those steps and, and manage to talk to the people, then you can get guidance on, on those kind of things. Um, I've got a question. I think I might leave this for everyone. But another one, I guess, for you, Sarah, about case studies that are there sort of some case studies online perhaps that people can look with we talked heard about some of the plant life ones to see how some of the more community group um projects have actually taken off is there something yeah so we have got a few case studies on the dcc web pages um and we right. also um funded um well so i worked with the biosphere so we have the north devon life on the verge project as well so the biosphere foundation have got information but um, we do need to um, pick this up again. So it would be great if anybody is doing stuff in Verges and you've got any learning that you can share to, to share it with us and then we can put it on the website. That'd be brilliant. So Mike Wallow is picking this up. Um, we can give you his details. That'd be great. That, that sounds excellent, actually. So I, I know from our perspective, it's been helpful talking to other groups that are trying to get off the ground as well with, with all this. Right, um, I'm going to ask Leo and Kate if they can join us just for the last um, sort of 10 minutes, really, because we've got, um, we had lots and lots of questions that came through when you we were both, both speaking, so excellent talks raised lots of uh, lots of questions and i'm going to go right back to the beginning actually which is an excellent one from andreas for leo um if it's something that i've spoken to leo about on numerous occasions but i think it's a good one is there any discussion about having some of these green or wildlife bridges to connect verges like you see in europe and the states um yeah i think we uh we we're not as advanced as they are in the continent at the moment because uh, I know Germany and Holland they they build them by the dozen some sometimes they have built quite a few and one of the problems we have here is the cost to retrofit uh, these green bridges they're really expensive or well, new schemes there are quite a few now being built across the country as part of new road sections new bypasses so they are becoming slowly gradually becoming more common um, a few years ago, well, several years ago, I suggested one over Harden connecting both sides of Harden Forest. And we got to the kind of detailed design stage, but then um, they decided it was going to be too expensive and they had other priorities. So they had to prioritize the, uh, um, the investment. So it, the money went elsewhere. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I, I, they, are, they are becoming more and more uh, common. And I'm, I'm hoping with this as, as we progress, They'll be uh, they'll become easier and faster to build. 
Yes, yeah, it's sort of been quite exciting projects, really. Um, I, this is one sort of for all of you, uh, in a way, really, because when you see a verge that's been left for quite a while, which, as um, Sarah was saying, you know, some have now you know, gone for a few years where they've not been cut at all, and we've got quite sort of thick bramble and scrub developing. You know, what, what's the sort of balance there between, you know, with benefits to wildlife? We may have lost some grass verge. We might not know what what state that was in, but we do have a scrub habitat. You know, are, are we better intervening or better to leave it, you know, as it is? Because it's quite an uphill struggle, I guess, if you've got it quite thick with scrub to get a grassland habitat back, isn't it? Is anyone not sure who'd like to answer that one? <laughs> Well, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think what, what I do is uh, you, it's, it's important to keep a balance. Bramble is quite, depending where you are, Bramble is quite invasive and, and, and will cover the ground quite quickly. So one of, one of the things that I, I do is um, I cut as hard as I, can, as I can, cut and collect. Maybe if you can cut twice a year from July onwards and collect all the risings. Uh, if you have time and resources, you can keep doing that for a couple of years. Otherwise, uh, spot treatment might be an option, especially where I think in areas where you've got traffic management restrictions or the problem with, with dust and some of the, the bigger, busier roads is the cost of traffic management. Because every time you close a lane, it's, you, you're talking about thousands of pounds. And depending where you are, like the 838, for instance, we can only do that at night. So when you do, you do have the luxury of a lane closure, then you just want to get the job done as quickly as possible. So what we often do is, uh, is, is cut and collect, uh, treat the regrowth in the following spring. And then if you want to do something to enhance or uh, use green hay, then you, can, uh, you should be ready to do that by late summer. Cool. And, okay. I mean, that's an interesting difference, isn't it? So between Leo's roads and, and you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I'm introducing something uh, completely different. So, I mean, if you've got a community <laughs> doing this, then yeah. you, know, you don't have the luxury of being able to do road closures in the first place, and and it is it is a headache, uh, you know. Yeah. So. Um, so, you know, I would say it, it all depends on the verge and the practicalities of the verge as much as anything, doesn't it, as to what you can achieve as a community group. Um, but in, in an ideal world, then, as Leo said, you know, we have, you know, scrub is a really important habitat, but, you know, the loss of meadows, wildflower meadows is, is greater. And so if you can manage it, clear the scrub, get on top of it. It's a fun, very satisfying job to do. <laughs> so, um, so do it. But you know, as a community group, you can only do it if you've got the resource, the time, lots of energy. So, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, question for Kate, actually, maybe um, is that, uh, and again, it's that on the community group scale. And you mentioned about you know getting rid of your arisings and cuttings. Um, and also something I had noticed along the A38 that there are sort of, I assume, kind of habitat piles, if you like, but on sort of small, more urban verges or perhaps where it is, it's something that we're having a slight headache with is it's great. We can rake things off, but then we do generate huge piles of, um, you know, grass cuttings. Do you have sort of some advice? And this is something that other people have uh, brought up as well. Where do you stick it all if you haven't got a community <laughs> composting scheme? <laughs> yeah, quite no. There's um, a few a few different ways. So some groups. I think there's a nice example, nice case study down from uh, Kent Wildlife Trust, who have created sort of smaller habitat piles within the verge. So for some of the for some of it, even if not all of the, especially in the early years when you've got so much grass to to try and cut back to, to get rid of. Um, it is it is a bit of a problem. So where um, Dorset Dorset Council have sort of got around it by using sacrificial sites within the verge network, as it were. So other sites within the verge that you can sort of leave it to, to compost down for quite a few months and then get rid of sort of anything that's left when there's a lot smaller volume of it um, coming onto the year. Um, and there are, I think. Um, the Shropshire group um, are, are trying to link up with um, the biomass digesters in the area that, that farmers might have. They're sort of exploring the anaerobic digestion of, of 
the the grass growth and incineration. So it's there are new ideas coming. It's it's a definitely not a problem solved at the moment, but um there are there are some some ways some ways around it and things happening. In, Can I yeah. just creative? <laughs> Tracy, on a practical level, I don't know if it was you, but there was a community group who got involved in managing a verge, cut it, and then took the arisings to the local waste site and were charged. Mm. And they were obviously not very happy. So I'm not quite sure where that got to. I don't know if anyone on this call is, but that is just something I just wanted to raise. Yeah. I think yeah. I've heard, I have heard of, of that happening, actually. So it wasn't us. Yeah. No, we've. We're quite near the beginning of our journey, so we're trying to figure figure some of this out. Yeah, um, community uh, composting or something. Yeah, well, that would be great. It's a whole other project, isn't it? But that, you know, these kind of things or systems would be ideal. Um, there was a um, an, a, a question actually about um, vehicle emissions because um, both Leo and Kate mentioned the sort of increased sort of fertility of road verges. Um, so do we think that that shift to zero emissions is going to have some benefits for the wild flowers on verges? Yeah, I think there was a study um, years ago, remember the nitrate accumulation can certainly enrich the soil around um, and the closer you are to the road corridor, the, the kind of the, the higher the nutrient, the, the nitrogen content in the soil. Uh, I think that's certainly something that we will benefit. I think we all benefit from uh, is now that the emissions are tend to kind of be reduced. And I mean, if you imagine 30 years ago, we still have a lot of lead around. So that was even something else kind of a polluting the soil. But I think as they, they, the vehicles, they become um, a lot more efficient. There is still a lot of things that are not really taken into account, which is uh, there are lots of heavy metals in the components of the vehicles. Uh, things like hydraulic fluid, uh, full of cadmium battery fluid, all, all these things, they kind of, uh, they all end up either on, in the soil around the verges or they go into the, uh, into the uh, freshwater systems. Especially when it rains, you get that kind of under, you know, the, the wash under your car. You know, those things, they, um, yeah, it's just, it's, uh, it's just the sad thing. Road voyages are great, but roads are horrible. <laughs> Keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's an interesting one. That um, we had a there's a plant life report from back in 2017 um, called "We Need to Talk About Nitrogen and, and all of the sort of different problems it can cause, especially for road voyages. Um But I think there's been a a research paper published just this year or maybe last year, um, all about the effects of sort of pollution on road verges and how far that spreads from sort of from the road verges um, roads outwards um, but with all that considered there's still you know so much benefits to the you know the and the importance of, of road verge habitats themselves but hopefully things are moving in a in a positive way <laughs> yes yes we, we can we can just hope really for that I think um I'm aware that we've actually run out of time. I think we could sit here and talk about this for ages. Um, the, the, the talks have been recorded, so people watching can can log in again and watch them as many times as they like. Um, and all the questions that are in the comments boxes and things will be there as well. Um, I hope you've got all the links. Um, if we haven't put all the links up, then they'll come out in an email to you all afterwards. So it just really remains to me to say thank you enormously to our three guests tonight. That was really interesting. And I hope that we've inspired some parish councils and community groups and individuals all around Devon to um, get going on their verges and, um, and create some wonderful wildlife habitat. Um, just before we go, I just need to, um, ooh, I need to just say that we have one more talk in this series um, from Lynn Kenderdine from Devon Wildlife Trust on the 29th of April at 7.30. And she's going to be talking about how you create a nature recovery network. So it's all about linking landowners together and looking at how you get connectivity in your landscape. Um, so I'll say good night and thank you very much for Donna and Steve as well behind the scenes who are um, have been toggling us on and off and 
putting questions into the um, into the chat box. So thanks very much to our audience, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.